on deck. Are you guys ready for us to go ahead and do the drop and release? Ready. Roger. Roger. And uh, Kirk is past the transom. Good copy. And then are we powered up on Atalanta just yet? I don't have power yet on Atalanta. And deck, uh, Atalanta's in the water. Roger. Copy.
Are you ready to hold position on the ship? Go ahead, Bridge. Uh, keep moving ahead for now. Thank you. Bridge now. Can we go ahead and uh, hold position right here? Thank you. Yeah. Yep. So do we want to see if this uh, 
ground falls is from the ramen system and turn us off? Or do we want to proceed? Yeah, C can you guys hear Kevin? Yeah, I got you. Okay. So you're running through your system checks now. You want to hold here? Uh, system checks are finished on our end. Uh, I didn't get that. I'm not sure. Maybe you're muted. Yep. System checks are finished on our end. Okay. I can hear that you said finished, but the mic is very uh, yeah, hard I'm to hear you in the mic. I'm going to try and increase this yeah, volume. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for Kevin. Uh, yeah, so our checks, our tests are finished and we're, we're good here. Yeah. Okay. Um, stand by one. Okay, Pablo, we're we're content to go down, but we're st we're getting that 100. We got 128k ground fault. Oh, okay, let, let me check with Kevin here, and I'll get back to you in a second. Back to a meg now. It's fluctuating, so it's not really like it's not a hard ground at all. It's just okay. Hey, okay, give us a second here. Okay. <laughs> he wants a minute. Okay, front row, we're doing one last check and we'll, we'll have an answer for you in a second. Okay, and just so you know, Pablo, ground faults, it seems intermittent has gone off now. We No issue I'm seeing here now. I did a test where I turned off our heaters. There. I'm good to go. Okay, front row. Uh, we are good to go here. Okay. All right. Descending. Okay, Sarah. Go for, say, 25 meters a minute, and we see what we're able to do here. All right. Uh, let's get the winch going first. I need to know that, too. Okay, so uh, for those home uh, still with us, uh, we're back. Uh, both vehicles are back in the water. Uh, so what happened is that, uh, uh, well, I guess our working hypothesis is that uh, a little droplet of water got into one of the connectors. Uh, there are about 50 to 100 connectors in the ROV, and it all takes one of them to take a little bit of water to uh, to, to show a little ground fault, which is uh, engineering speaking for uh, there is a short somewhere. Uh, so luckily everything's thought of beforehand, and this is not a, something to be worried about. It happens all the time. Uh, we we cleaned it up, uh, tested everything, and now we're back uh, going down. Uh, no more faults uh, so far. Uh, we're at 85 meters and coming down. So thank you for your patience, and if you're new here, this is a part two of the dive where we test uh, the laser system once again. And it's on Little Herc. Okay, we should be able to do the full thing, Sarah. Let's try for 28 meters. Per meter. All systems are good. 
all systems are good. Okay. Um, we got the intermittent ground fault, but it's not hard. It's two two hundred forty k right now. It comes and goes. I need to keep an eye on it for a moment. If if the uh, back row is happy with that. I'm happy with that. Oh, yeah, I know the craft is always, like, that's lots on the craft. You can go all day like that. Hey, uh, Amber. Uh, hey, uh, do you want to loop our camera feed into, into the system at some point? Okay. All right, remind me which PC that's going to be on. Or I can add it. What's the name I think of it the was computer? PC2. PC2, okay. I think they replaced the uh, Thurber cam, the still cam. Okay, I'll take a peek. Mm -hmm. So we have to route um, a new computer to that. Okay. I think it's video. Uh, like twenty, twenty-seven or twenty-eight. Probably just leave it where you have it. I think might uh, might be good. It's touchy. There, they ins Okay. So we've got these two, like, Looks like the ground falls back at 19k.
Yes, I'm here. Um, yeah, I'm available. SPL code for science body line. Ooh. Yep, and here we have the SPL open, which means that if you all have any questions, feel free to check out our website and you can put them in a chat. We'll be here to answer them. So welcome aboard. We are here aboard the exploration vessel Nautilus. We are on our second attempt at a dive today. We are in a location in the Central Pacific Ocean near the Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atolls. We are currently diving down uh, to explore. Daniel, excuse me for a second. The science in the back row, can I switch off the Raman instrument momentarily here? Kevin, uh, yeah, uh, give us a second here. We have another <laughs> troubleshooting going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I got a pretty good ground fault here, and I'm kind of okay. suspicious of that stuff. Oh, okay, I'll get Kevin on the on the line. Yeah. Okay. You can go ahead and turn us off. M Mike, do you hear that? No. You can go ahead and turn us off. You okay. can turn us off. Okay. Dan, I'm turning off the cameras there. Ethernet bottle. Try the ramen itself first. This is an audio slate for dive H1952, uh, UTC time is 23.33.30. So I got. It is that. I just turned it off and it's now it's 80 seconds. Yeah, and it's going to come back to like a bang or two. Yeah, it's that. It's not the Ethernet switch, it's this one. Yeah. The bottom.
consensus here, guys. Uh, well, <laughs> we recover, right? It's up to him. He's the chief. I don't want to think that it's their instrument. It is their instrument. I mean, our so and, and apparently it's a depth related thing because we didn't see it until we got down way. So that was probably true in the last place. It first showed up at 50. When do you are you collecting measurements while we're descending, or can we turn it off and wait so we can talk about it? It's off right now. So our our instrument, it's once you get into that bottle, it's isolated over Vicors. So the only three places that it could be is the one that we cleaned, the inline splice that we did not open, uh, or the cable or something like that. So there's no danger to the Raman instrument that has the sapphire window. If there is a connector that's having an issue would be the A1 bottle, the battery bottle. Can you tell how much current? Yeah. So it's kind of your, it's kind of your call if you're okay with it. At least get this dive in for exploration purposes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Once we get it, I'm not going to put it in. Are you guys okay with that plan? Leave it off, leave it at the bottom, turn it on, see what happens. So the only hitch. Well, there's also three kilowatt hours of three, yeah, three kilowatt hours of batteries in that A1 bottle. So if the bottle, if the connector failed and it leaked through, what? 
<laughs> I can't, because of the laser safety, you have to have input in or the battery won't turn on. I mean, I can, in a future dive, if you wanted to just run off the battery, we can, it would run pretty much the whole dive, but I have to open up A1 and rewire it to remove that safety at mechanism. I would, well, one thing is the laser, if it gets too cold and it gets down to 4C, you're never going to get it back up to 28. So okay. it kind of has to stay in standby mode on the way down. Okay. So maybe, uh, I mean, we're at, sure, I'm all of, I have a lot of uh, housekeeping data and I don't see any issues on my end. I don't see any overcurrents or anything like that. In every single one of my channels, I look at the currents and voltages, and I'm I'm drawing 2.5 amps ish off your system, and that's at 20 four volts. Yep. yep. So if you turn us back on, what does it go to right now? I mean, the other option we could do. Sounds good, Kevin. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Go to yeah. the bottom, turn us on there, and see yeah. where we are. We can yeah. also keep our instrument on, like, on for a short period of time, and then when we get it back on surface, just service every single connector that it touches. Well, that's resolved, Daniel. Feel free to um, 
you know, light up the airways. Hello again, everybody. Yeah, we're just uh, going through some troubleshooting with the engineers here. Uh, we even have a few issues with our RV, but we are looking to get on schedule with our dive. And if you're just tuning in, welcome aboard the Exploration Nautilus. We are here in the Central Pacific Ocean exploring an area called the Kimmy Reef and Palmyra Atolls. We are just right outside the uh, boundaries of what's called the Pacific uh, Marine, excuse me, the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National oh, Monument. It's all on. It was still within the ex ex EEZ or Exclusive Economic Zone of the United States. And on this are big words to say exactly where we are, but we are exploring uh, area of the undersea, which is largely unexplored, uh, an unnamed geot or tabletop mountain under the ocean. And you probably have been checking the feeds and might have seen a few things float by. So, just uh, our patients can often be rewarded by unexpected things swimming by. So, stay tuned. Yeah, so we're seeing, can everyone hear me? Just making sure. Okay, yep, cool. we can hear you. Um, I'm just using like a different way of connecting, so I just wanted to make sure. But um, we're just seeing some siphonophores, some jellies as we float down. Um, Daniel, are we, I think we're going to about what, um, 1200 meters? Yeah, okay. I believe we are on this dive. Uh, anybody else is free to correct us. Yeah, about uh, 1120. Um, we are going to try and use the laser spectrometer down when we get to the seafloor. Um, we were just troubleshooting some little things until, and yeah, just making sure that we can get there safely. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> out of precaution, uh, we are not collecting uh, our depth profiling, our water column uh, analysis this time. And we will uh, reassess the situation at the bottom and see if it's safe to, to operate the laser in this dive. Uh, so we're about almost 800 meters uh, from the bottom. Uh, telemetry shows that we should be um, uh, down in uh, at depth uh, in about uh, 25 minutes, maybe, uh, maybe more. Uh, yeah, stay tuned, and, and we'll see you when we're down there. Eleven thirty. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, Pablo, I just have a really quick question. Um, you mentioned that shooting the laser is dependent on um, temperature. Why is that? Yeah, so uh, in this instrument, we, we're using a laser, right? And, and lasers uh, have this property that they are very monochromatic, meaning that uh, they shine at a unique color, very, very sharp color, uh, as opposed to white light, which is a combination of all colors. Laser is the opposite, it's only one color. Now, to, to achieve that one color specific, uh, the, the crystals and all the optics that make the laser, they have to be at a very precise temperature. Uh, the one that we have here uh, likes to be between 28 degrees Celsius and 32 degrees Celsius. And any uh, excursion, any deviation from that nominal uh, temperature 
it will cause the laser to misfire. Essentially, either we don't get any laser or we get laser different color than the one we want, uh, which doesn't help our measurements. So uh, we have heaters in the bottle that uh, keep everything in the control and safe and make sure that the laser stays within its uh, preferred temperature, cozy and warm. Uh, but because we have this ground fault um, uh, that we're still trying to figure out where exactly it's coming from, um, uh, out of caution, we turn off uh, all of the heaters in our bottle, meaning that the, as we're going down, the, the laser is cooling down. Uh, right, right, so, so you so can only, if the bottom isn't within that temperature range, can't shoot. Exactly, so at the bottom we'll take a reading of temperature. Uh, if it's too cold for the laser to even with the heaters uh, to reach the nominal temperature, then there is no experiment uh, because you know, yeah. it's not going to work anyway and yeah. it's not safe. Uh, if we find that it's uh, within temperature, then we, we may proceed to, uh, to do the science experiment if we determine that the ground fault is not, uh, it's not a risk for the, for the instrument and the vehicle, of course. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. Also, while Pablo was explaining, there was a Tina 4 on screen, it looked like. I don't know what it was. Just it almost looked like a jellyfish of some kind. It yeah. flew by quick. Yeah, I didn't see I didn't see any tentacles on it, so that's why I want to say Tina four, but I also didn't see any teens, so who knows? Some yeah. sort of jelly. Oh, and I said teens. Um, what that means is um, Tina fours are another type of jelly. They use um, these. They're also called cone jellies, I believe, because they have rows of these like they're called teens, but they have these rows of. Um, things for locomotion and they kind of beat to help the Tina 4 move. Good, thank you. Yep. Can I see the uh, arm in the bubble cam, please? That's got a ground fault on it, too. So for those of you wondering, okay, what is our arm doing? It's like we got zoom in, zoom out, kind of rolling the wrist a bit. We're just doing little calibrations to make sure that our video and our robotic arm are intact for us to do some science here on the ground, underwater. And yeah, a lot of those zoom ins are for our video to make sure that the feed looks nice and clean. Okay, I'll get the bubble camera back on the gauges. Okay, uh, ready to go from the front row's perspective, I think. Uh, uh, science, let me know if you'd like the ramen instrument on right now, or... Looks like there's still a 12K fault before we turn on, though. All right, Pablo, I don't know, are you muted back there? Yeah, hey, uh, oh, Kevin, yeah. we're having a hard time hearing you. I don't know if Amber can adjust your level or if you can move your microphone closer to your mouth. I just moved the microphone. Looks like we have a 12K fault before the ramen system is turned on. That's the uh, craft arm. So let me just kill that for a minute.
just be another few seconds here, hopefully. Okay, there we go. So the the ground the ground pulse system just takes takes some time to cycle sometimes. Um we're ready from here, uh if you would like to cycle the instrument. Uh we're ready. Okay. Uh, okay, on now. Looks like there's a big eel to the right. Mm. Just want to mention that. Oh, yeah. I see it. Hi, ah, it's coming. It's coming right towards us. It looks like. Oh, yeah, wow, it's like a highlight. Big white. Lots well, of stuff. Oh, another gender. Fish don't have genders. So the ground fault's going to show up here now momentarily, I believe. You want to take some zooms on here while we're waiting? Yeah, I mean, if you can, sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, go ahead. We're going towards our eel friend. Yeah, I think the, the big eel is actually a bit of, uh, oh, he's right there. Wow. wow look it's a that big guy. one. That's a big one. And so dark in color. Yeah. I currently, I don't have direct access to a computer right now, so I'll get yeah. an ID Upset. when I can, but we can Data, just can you log that I just started the uh, digital still camera? Yes, what a beauty. And this other uh, flower-looking creature is a uh, sea lily, type of crinoid, very common down here. Is it the digital still camera? Mm -hmm. We just got an ID from scientists ashore saying that the stalked crinoids are in the Crinocrinididae family. Um, they also mentioned that the lack of, um, I guess, cilia, I'm not quite sure, but there's sometimes they can look a bit fuzzy, but there is not really that fuzz on these guys, so there might be some sort of predation going on, but. Um, yeah, I'll try and get a ID for the eel when I can.
Would the ground fault would have cycled by now? Yes, it would have, yeah. So it's looking good. Uh, one thing I haven't done is turned on our camera. Okay, interesting. Which I'll do right now. Was it on before? Yes. Okay. Although it should be isolated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might tell us something, though. Camera's on. Roger. How do I get to the side tone again? In your keypad, yes. top right button. I just zoomed in a bit on Adelina for you. Just because it's pretty. Whoa, too dark. And I will say that we saw a lot of these crinoids, or these um, stalked crinoids, which are part of the sea star um, subphylum, I believe, echinoderms. Um, we saw a bunch of these on our last dive in shallower depths on um, rocky substrates, so it's kind of cool to see them again in a completely different spot. We um, even got a sample of one last dive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was really nice to see it up close in the lab. And those, and that sample can be used for genetic uh, testing to genotype those and see what it actually is. Yeah, so if y'all at home are ever curious about our work once we get our uh, ROV back, uh, you can always tune in to our wet lab where we will be processing our samples. This includes biological samples as well as geologic ones. And yeah, you'll get to see us do science in real time aboard the ship. And um, scientists sure also helped out with the idea of the eel. Looks like an ophididid. Um, part of the, looks cl most closely like the Lamprogrammus brunswigai interesting species name but um yeah looks great thanks steve wow lots of these stuck crinoids huh yeah and we also have a coral in the lower leftish middle area um looks like a well we thought the top of this mound would be flat for you guys with the uh laser dive bot is this working for you? It's okay? So this isn't really an ocean question, but more of a computer one. Does anybody know how to change the brightness on the desktops? <laughs> I'm not familiar with iOS. Yes, I can help you with that. Yeah. Give me one so sec. <laughs> zoom in there. Wow, is this a shrimp? Oh, yeah. It's a... Not a... <gasps> it's one oh, it is a shrimp. Oh, it's a long-legged yeah. one. Wow, look at this one. Oh, yeah. Some fine swimming. Oh, wow. Oh. Oh, and a really neat crinoid pattern. But yeah, we have a, wow, look at the shrimp. Oh, that's awesome. Really neat, darkish abdomen area, too. OK, so. Uh, the, the laser team here has conducted our troubleshooting and our checks, and we even got a data point here. So uh, everything is working as it should. Laser is 
nominal temperature, camera nominal temperature, uh, no ground faults anymore. Uh, I think we're uh, we're ready to uh, to do a first measurement. So, um, uh, uh, Mike, mm -hmm. if you could put us at three meters altitude, please, uh, on top of a black rock. Uh, okay. Um, Oh, and uh, Amber, Amber, uh, do you want to pipe in the camera for, for I Mike? I already got that. Oh, you want it here? Okay, yes. Yeah, so that he can uh, see the... Uh, which uh, square would you like that in, Mike? Yes. For the PC to be in. Is there a screen I can take over? Oh, uh... Yeah, that's a good question, Mike. So uh, I think maybe we want to wait for Amber to to see if she can put in the camera for you there. Uh, yep. Just got to pick which one to take away. Oh, uh, it, it's, up to, it's up to Mike. Uh, yeah, whatever. we can lose the gauges here. It's okay. Okay. So this, um, you see where I'm pointing? Yeah, this the one. one. Here, yeah. This, yep, you got it. Okay, so uh, now Navigator has a view that we have from the instrument, so he can select the right place for us to, to do so. So we're going to do a preliminary uh, um, uh, measurement. Uh, Mike, I'm going to circle here this guy. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and we're going to turn on the, the target laser for you, so you, you'll be seeing a red spot. Uh, Roger. Yeah, you can see the red spot in the middle of the screen. Yep. Yes, so in fact, Mike, pick anything black that you see over there or dark and just get us at three meters and that's good for now. Here's the uh, the one coming into view that you had tagged there. Yep, perfect. Yep. Yep, that's, that's great. Yep. yep. Oh, I meant to. Um, so the camera, uh, your camera is uh, is reversed. Does it need to be? You need to be have it in this orientation. More of a for next time thing. Uh, no, we can move it. We just wanted to make you suffer a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> If anybody's familiar with subsea rafe and control software, we could maybe do it in software. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it may take us a minute to figure out how to rotate here. Uh, oh no, it's not. A, it's not really uh, important for for yeah. now. It's just a just a convenience item. Okay. Yeah. So this is great, Mike. Uh, yep. If you can stay over here at, uh, and go down a little bit to three meters, then we're good. And for our viewers okay. at okay. home, we are looking at this in our set. Do a 5x5. Five five. Uh, mm -hmm. Turning mm -hmm. off the target. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Also, just going to make a quick mention. I think the shrimp we saw earlier with that uh, neat, darker abdomen, I think it's part of dendro dendrobronchiata. Not sure, though. We're gonna take. A, we took one data point here. Looks pretty good. We're gonna take another one, uh, just for redundancy. Laser is firing. Uh, We've got to come down a bit too. I'm a bit high here still. Yep.
Do you want to collect the data from a rock that we're going to collect? Uh, no, this is just a little, okay. little functional testing to, to make sure we respond. Yeah. Then it's interesting here, I, uh, I'm seeing some uh, perhaps silicate uh, signal, which would make sense given that this is an old volcano uh, which uh, erupted uh, uh, iron silicates and glass uh, quartz, uh, things like that. So that means that we're, we're working pretty well and um, we're even further or at higher altitude than, than what we think uh, as our optimal measurement, which is good news, meaning that we can see uh, uh, data even a bit further away than we thought. So this is all very good news. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I think uh, this is, uh, Mike, uh, this is good uh, first uh, test here. Um, I think everything's working as we, as we wanted to do. Uh, I think it's time to proceed to the to the calibration target uh, test. Uh, so uh, please find us a flat area, perhaps in the sediment, and, uh, and then just we'll do the test there. OK. Yes. What's that? Mm. Oh, down there. Yeah. yeah. Do we want to try to find yeah, a flat surface right here, or do we want to travel and see if we can find a better area? There's a patch of sediment here. Like, this is the most se continuous sediment I've seen in this little spot. That, that works for us. Okay. Oh, did you guys see that little shark or fish pass by? Darn it, no. What? I didn't. Missed it. Shark? I see a shrimp. Uh, um, oh, there's oh, another one. Oh, yeah. Um, was it, what direction was it? Uh, behind us. Darn. It's all right. Was all right, it uh, Hercules or Atlantopia? Uh, Hercules. Ah. Sometimes Atlanta picks up on something. Maybe it'll circle back. Mm -hmm. I saw another one earlier. It's probably the same one. Mm -hmm. Looks like some sort of urchin to the lower right. Can't quite tell from this oh. height though. It's now off screen. Is it in lower right? Um, yeah, it's off frame now. But ah. the lower right. Mm. But yeah, we're seeing a lot of crinoids. Mm -hmm. See the leaves. We saw one coral earlier. I couldn't get a good look at it to identify it, but it's hopeful. Is this okay here, or is there too much? Uh, so it's kind of mixed a bit. Uh, it, I mean, it look, looks pretty flat to me. Uh, I mean, difficult to say. <laughs> but it, it is on a it is on a bit of a slope. It's not mm -hmm. totally flat at all. Uh, yeah. Th then th th try to find. Uh, so, so Mike, we want to do a. Uh, different altitude profile, so we're gonna hover over the place and go out. So the the further the we are, the better it's gonna be for us. So, so if you don't like this one, let's move on to to a new place. Uh, it's it's fine for me. It's just like if I turn sideways here, you can see like we're on a little bit of a there's, there is some slope. It's not much. Yeah. No, I th you know I, I think that's gonna, that's gonna be okay. Uh, okay. I also think it's fine because the altimeter is right next to the instrument, so. And you want three meters? Uh, let's go to four. Yeah, one of the four first. Four, yeah, okay. okay. Pretty much there. Yeah. There's also, there was a coral on the screen. Oh, Mike, so, sorry, uh, before that, uh, deploy the target, please. Okay. I'll say really quick, there was a coral on screen. It looked like a chrysogorgia. I, I think this really is know. a better spot over here. But yeah, I'll let the spectrometry happen and we'll get back to bio later. Unless we see something really cool. Yeah, this this, this one's better. like a shark. Bring back the shark. <laughs> mm. 
think I see an urchin from earlier you were talking about. Yeah, bottom yeah, right there. Yeah, the little there. black bulby thing. <laughs> At any point during this dive, will we be doing photogrammetry? No, we don't really have the camera configuration or um, for doing that. Okay, thanks. Just let me know. Is that a tripod fish on the top? Um, Come down a few meters yeah. on Argus. Just. Uh, Two or three. There's a fish coming into frame. Up. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. it's gone. In case you're wondering, uh, yes, that is the laser target that m clearly marked for Mike, so he wouldn't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, and we told Mike that for every second that he can stay within the bullseye, he gets one M&M. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, is that your preferred candy? Or is it Reese's Pieces? Peanut butter cups. That's what it's got to be. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, Mike. The way yeah. these M&Ms are about to be gone back here. <laughs> I think we've all been fiending for chocolate on this trip. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Petition for chocolate chip cookies. Oh, there's the fish again. Oh, oh wow. Oh, the hey. tripod fish. Beautiful. So cute. There was also a shrimp that flew by in a uh, satellite P3. Man, I'm really missing everything today. Sorry, everyone. I don't think those are tripod fish, I was actually. Say, I'd Rat tails, probably. Ah. Looks a bit different. Mm. Can I do now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. I Ooh, love the smiley face in the middle. So, Pablo, I have a question for you. Yep, you know, I'm here. Yeah. At some point, do you mind ex uh, explaining the Ramos spectrometer to us in Spanish? We are looking to get some highlight reels and uh, have those in different translations. Yeah, I, I will be happy to, but uh, let's finish the, the calibration procedure first, uh, uh, just to make sure that we got it right, and, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll go into that. But, por supuesto, encantado de hablar español en cuanto pueda. Thank you for that. Take your time. Mm -hmm. Perfect landing, Mike. Mm -hmm. Three-pointer. Four-pointer, maybe. Okay, so... I know Dan's got a target on the other side. Do you want this side without the metal yeah. sticking up? Yeah, yeah, without metal, yeah. yeah. Mm. 
beautiful. And, and now, if you can hover four meters on top, please. Four meters. So the, the procedure we're going to go through uh, in the next few minutes, maybe half an hour, maybe one hour, we'll see, is uh, much like you saw earlier, um, the, the team was uh, doing white balance corrections for the, for the camera. Uh, we need to do our own uh, type of white balance corrections as well. For us, that means uh, we need to uh, understand uh, how much exposure uh, do we need to use to measure meaning how how much time do we collect signal for. Uh, we need to adjust also our focus. Uh, we do have a telescope inside the, the bottle and, um, and that telescope can be adjusted so we can measure at different distances. Uh, we tested uh, in, in the lab, uh, we tested underwater uh, in lab conditions. Um, we haven't tested under pressurized water. Um, which uh, we know may affect a little bit the, the calibration. Also, this water, as you can see, uh, is full of uh, organic uh, matter. There is marine snow coming in here, so that may also affect how we how we measure. And lastly, uh, it is possible that our sapphire window, uh, the eye of our instrument through which we should laser and collect signal back, it is possible that this uh, window uh, flexes ever so slightly under pressure, uh, just half a millimeter uh, would uh, change uh, how far the laser lands from the bottle into the into the rock or the sediment. So we need to understand that uh, that effect. So we're going to spend some time here uh, at different altitudes, uh, hovering over the target uh, and shooting at different times uh, to start getting an understanding of, uh, of uh, how to how to white balance, how to correct our measurements. I'm also just going to quickly say that was definitely a rat tail and it looks like it's from the genus. Uh, if it loads, Gandomus. Looks really similar. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, bullseye, Mike. Thank you. Uh, it might be as good as it gets. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you know, do your best to stay here. I think I think we got it from here. Thanks. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> as we, as we speak, um, we thank each other. The laser goes off yeah, target. Yeah, wanders <laughs> off. So uh, uh, you cannot see it in your screen home, probably, but uh, there is a little bit of a current uh, uh, coming and is moving the vehicle. So. Uh. Wow. So what's the laser doing here with the uh, uh, calibrator? No. Okay. So we're recording signal now. So um, and we're seeing. Great. So we're seeing the signals from from this material, which, uh, as you saw, is uh, no more than plastic, um, uh, high density polyethylene, as I can see from the signals that we get here in our mm -hmm. in our instrument. So uh, this is very good news. That means that uh, at this distance we can see um, we can see the, the the target, and now we're going to go through our routine of uh, of opening the camera more or less, uh, changing the focus a little bit so as that we optimize and we perfect the, the measurement uh, at 4 meters. And then we'll do it at, at further distance, 5 meters, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So stay tuned for more. 
We are wandering off the target. Goes to show that our instruments need to be tested before they can be officially used in the field. And that's what we do. You know, it's a big part of engineering. You test and test and test. Another eel like fish in the background, upper mm -hmm. left. It looks like there's also a, is it two of them? I don't know, just one up? Maybe two, but there's definitely one. Oh, cool, you have the laser feed on uh, stream three. Nice. Do we know what that like little red gracefully swimming shrimp is? Yeah, it's just some sort of shrimp. I think it's part of the... I want to say it's part of the Caribbean family. Um, yeah, just it's too hard to ID more because <laughs> they're so small and so similar looking from a distance. So Sarah, can you tell can you tell us what website you're looking at to help with their species ID? Yeah, so what we're mainly using is NOAA's um, ocean exploration website, and it's the Benthic Deep Water Animal Identification Guide. Um, it has a bunch of really awesome pictures that show characteristic features of certain species, um, and yeah, it's really helpful in helping us figure out what we're looking at. Um, I will say I'm not an expert at ID, so we have scientists ashore helping us um, as we get better. But yeah, we're all on a learning journey. <laughs> I do, I'm generally better at corals than other things, um, given my background, but it still can be super tricky when you're just looking at a camera. Hi, Mike, uh, w we are done at four meters. We would like to be at five meters now. Five meters, okay. Same spot. Yeah, but they're, they're, um, So for those of you at home who want to follow along and help with a species ID, you can go to NOAA's Ocean Exploration website and go under Benthic Deepwater Animal Identification Guide version 3. And you can see all the available taxa on there ranging from mollusks to arthropods and yeah you can help us along and put your thoughts in the chat see if you can help us out that little you like fish is back oh, bottom yeah. left oh i see mm -hmm. likely a cutthroat eel but i can't quite see as we're doing these, this testing they move so gracefully, it's almost in slow-mo. <laughs> oh, there's another one in the top left. Great eyes, I am. Top left. Oh, I see it, yeah. It's awesome. Most likely cutthroat eels. Mm. 
Okay, Mike, thanks. We are five meters now. Uh, adjusting to five meters telescope distance. Yeah. And this is going to really, really challenge uh, skills of Mike the farther away we are. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> should know it's on autopilot. <laughs> doing anything <laughs> just pushing buttons yeah uh, okay so we still get data here but we're gonna have to adjust here so please keep us here mike as much as you can oh sorry autopilot please keep us here <laughs> take, the credit, take the credit <laughs> yeah uh, yeah you're welcome <laughs> Seems like we're getting some pretty good results. I was just saying, looking at the spectrometry really reminds me of organic chemistry. <laughs> mm. Yeah, in fact, uh, Raman spectroscopy has been used by chemists for the last, I don't say, 50, 60 years. Um, we could get better. Can you tell us how it works? Yeah, I I, I will in a in a little bit. Uh, yeah, sure. So it'll take me a couple of minutes, but uh, we, we're we're uh, we're actually doing this faster than I thought we'll do. So maybe we'll to finish this in a little bit. So, from what I understand, what they're doing right now is they're going back and forth between. Um, what do the what are, the, sorry, what do the meters mean again? Oh, okay. So they're changing the focal point of the laser, um, back and forth to get like the sweet spot. But. But yeah, so they keep the laser on a certain target and then they change the focal point length. Um, and then compare the spectra at different focal point lengths. 
and that's what they're doing now so basically the more accurate they can get with more distance the better and it looks like that they're getting about yeah they're getting good good data but just doing some more trials Daniel, do you have any jokes for us or anything? <laughs> yeah, I got a good one that's been brewing for a while. So what's a pirate's favorite letter? Oh, man. Um, R. R. Yeah. Uh, you think it's the R, but it be the C. No. Oh. 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 That was good. Gosh. <laughs> had I had an old coworker that told me that, that one. So I good. had it cracking up. <laughs> I thought I had it. <laughs> man. Y'all got any jokes, too? <laughs> you do them so well, I can't follow up to that. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, autopilot, please. Uh, <laughs> take us up one meter to altitude six, One please. meter, coming up. Now they're moving. So yeah, now they're moving the ROV up one meter, and then they're going to do the same um, focal length uh, trialing at six meters above the seafloor. Yeah, I, I, initially our our optimal operational distance or altitude uh, we we set for uh, between three and four meters. Oh, okay. So um, this is an improvement. So, uh, so of course, you know, uh, we can measure from further away, and that's what we're testing here: is how far can we go and still get a clean uh, uh, diagnostic measurement uh, of at least a calibration target. Right. Uh, and we want to keep doing this until we don't see it, uh, and that will give us the, the because this calibration target is potentially the best case scenario for a measurement. Uh, the farthest distance that we can measure this target uh, will tell us how far we can go then when we proceed to the science experiments. So yeah. uh, this is really exciting. So yeah. the, the, the better the instrument works, the longer we're going to be here. So <laughs> <laughs> so uh, hold on, everybody, a little bit of patience. And, uh, and this is really, really, really great results. I think uh, we're really, really excited to see the system working as good as it is. Um. It's really doing the butterfly stroke, that <laughs> shrimp. Um, but also, I just wanted to quickly ask, so just so the viewers know, too, um, what are you using as your diagnostic for the spectra? Like yeah, to see if it's in this case, we're using polyethylene, uh, okay. a polymer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a polymer plastic, is very good. Right? It's, yeah, plastic. <laughs> so <laughs> in fact, it's uh, the lead of one of your utility five-gallon buckets that you can buy at the store. Uh, right. And, um, and it was a last-minute improvisation to, to give the autopilot uh, enough, <laughs> enough ability to, to stay on target. Yeah. Uh, but it has the advantage. Uh, in fact, uh, polyethylene is a target that, uh, that we have flown to Mars. Cool. as a calibration target for the rovers there because it gives uh, peaks across the whole uh, the visible spectrum of the instrument. So we can calibrate uh, all the wavelengths and we can really know if we are really on a healthy and a stable instrument uh, almost every day before we measure. So it's, you know, sounds, uh, sounds cheap and sounds uh, uh, but simple, it but it works exactly. So, so we're pretty happy with this. I think, I think any ecologist will tell you that if it's cheap and it works, that's what they're going to use. So, exactly. <laughs> you're not wrong there. Going for efficiency, in both in materials and cost. Mm Look at those legs, everyone. <laughs> wow. Putting on a show. <laughs> Always dancing gracefully through the water. Sarah, can you tell us why the shrimp are shaped like that? Why their appendages are so long? Like, how is it able to move like that? Um, so, I mean, if you think about it, like, um, 
how do I explain this? If you think about it like um, people rowing, their oars are super long, right? So that generates more power when you're moving. So I can only imagine that these shrimp have longer appendages for locomotion purposes. Um, could be wrong, but that's my like logical guess. <laughs> and from what I what I know about um, adaptations, yeah. Yep. It's a great answer. Thank you. Generally, um, organisms won't have adaptations that they don't use. <laughs> they won't. Their bodies won't expend energy in creating something that isn't useful to them. So, if you see a shrimp with super long legs, that means that it has to be super useful to them for some reason. Um, but yeah, we still don't really know a lot of um, reason. Like sometimes we don't know the reasons why certain organisms have certain adaptations. So it can be kind of difficult. Um, to just look at an organism and be like, they have these long legs for this thing, but you can make pretty logical guesses based off of shallow water and terrestrial systems. I believe that term for uh, like, uh, like a body part that doesn't receive much use by animal, that's vestigial, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in humans, an example of vestigial parts include your appendix, uh, coccyx, the bottom of your backbone, and uh, your tonsils even. Yep. Yeah. When we used to have tails, which is, I think, just in field development, but I'm not sure. <laughs> hey, Mike. It looks like we're a little low. Low? And six meters? Or, uh, or off target. Yeah, no, I'm trying to correct that. Yeah. Okay. Wondering where that shark went and how we can get it back. Yeah, Give us too. another vertebrate. <laughs> or um, I remember one of the dives, we just had randomly a sea cucumber come on and it was kind of just dancing everywhere and then it went off frame. That was really funny. <laughs> Give us one of those. <laughs> But um, for anyone new, we are at about 1120 meters depth and we're testing the laser dive bot, doing some spectrometry, focal point testing, and yeah. Yep, welcome aboard. We are here on the exploration vessel Nautilus out in the Central Pacific Ocean. We're exploring an unnamed guillot right outside the uh, boundaries of the Pacific Remote Islands, or mean Marine National Monument. And yeah, we are currently in a, a relatively shallow dive today to help test out one of our uh, new instruments aboard, the uh, Laser Raman Spectrometer, which is part of a uh, new mission by SETI Institute. And so that is what you can see in Satellite P3. They are currently calibrating the spectrometer onto a plastic disc. And, and you guys can see in the in the Atalanta uh, camera there was a laser spot there in the middle. Some of the organisms we've seen so far are more stalked crinoids. Um, we've seen a few fishes, like we saw some cutthroat eels, some rat tails. Um, we saw a shark at one point, but we didn't get to get a good look at it. We saw some corals. Not a lot of corals, but some. Some good looking crinoids too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're just at the beginning of our dive. Um, how long is this dive going to be again? I think, what, 10, 11 to 14? I, I don't know. Correct me, please. <laughs> I think it's supposed to be 14 hours. Okay. Cool. I was close. <laughs> <laughs> so.
So for those of you who have seen our previous dives, uh, you might notice that some of the sunlight that's down here is actually uh, peeking below the ocean floor a little bit more. And yeah, that has to do with the different gradients that we go down in the ocean. Uh, the farther down you go, the darker it gets, and that's because the water column absorbs light. And it's because of this that we have different zones of the ocean. Uh, Sarah, do you know what those different zones are? Um, yes. <laughs> Off the top of my head, for some reason, no, but yes. Um, generally, we have the photic zone, um, which is above 200 meters. So um, everything below 200 meters, basically the really fast light attenuation, and everything gets really dark really quick. Um, but um, if you want to go from the surface, you first have the inner tile. Oh, I thought that was the thing on camera, but it's just the, the rope. Um, you first have the intertidal zone, so that's like your beaches, you know, what generally everyone interacts with. And then you have your continental shelf. Actually, do I want to? Oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Anyways, <laughs> um, you have your epipelagic zone, which is like where the sun is. That's that 200 meters in this photic zone. Um, do you need to talk? Never mind. Okay. Your photic zone, your mesopelagic, that's where the light is attenuating. And then um, you have under when it's completely dark, so past the thousand meters, it's your bathypelagic zone. Um, so that's along the continental slope. And then you get down to your abyssopelagic, which is from 4,000 to 6,000 meters. Yeah. Super dark. Come on. And then after that, we have our deepest, darkest region, the Hadal Pelagic, which um, is not, I think that's the limit of Hercules, I want to say. Or no, I think the Abyssal Pelagic is the limit of Hercules, 4,000 meters. Um, but Hadal Pelagic is like Mariana Trench. Super deep, super dark, not a lot of things. Um, we haven't really, well, we have explored there, but not many dives go that deep. Yeah, I yeah. think later in the season we may get to see uh, the Hadal Profiler go yeah. down to some of those depths. Because if, wait, um, can Little Hercules go down to 6,000? 6, 6,000, yes. Okay, so that's the abyssopelagic zone. Yeah, so right there. So, sorry to cut the, the science talk. No, uh, please, no, uh, so, um, so, Mike, we, we're finished with this um, long distance measurements. Uh, what we would like to do is to, to go back to one of the dark rocks. Uh, I'm going to point this one for you here. Sure, yeah. And a uh, five meters altitude, please. OK. And here, so what's going to happen? So what we've done over the last hour is we have um, uh, fine-tuned, if you want, turn the knobs mm -hmm. on, on our exposure our laser power, our timing, our autofocus. Yeah. And we have now found uh, the optimal parameters, we think. And now it's time to test that into a real real sample. So yeah. we're gonna we're gonna move over uh, one of these volcanic rocks and these rocks are most likely made of uh, of uh, iron silicate, uh, maybe some quartz on them as well. Uh, uh, they may be a little bit of uh, manganese, uh, perhaps even cobalt enrichment uh, over millions of years of slow uh, precipitation of, of heavy metals, uh, especially manganese. Uh, this could be an enrichment of manganese. So we can see manganese uh, here by looking at the fluorescence that this uh, element has in, in the spectrum. So not the Raman signal, but the fluorescence. So. Uh, we may not be able to see it here uh, because this is a test that we haven't done yet is to to look at uh, uh, mineral fluorescence or phosphorescence rather um, but this is something that we will we'll keep continue doing in over the next uh, few dives so um, uh, yeah, awesome. so, so now, now mike has moved us over our uh, our target and here now we're gonna uh, deploy the the corrected measurement parameters to verify that we can measure better than we could at the first measurement that we took when we first landed. Um. Sounds good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for those of you wondering, you know, what does that word precipitation mean? It's a way of 
chemicals, uh, they fall out of the water column and they add up on the surface. And if you're looking for a the idea of this, a little uh, easy experiment you can try at home is to mix up a, uh, like say some hot water. You can mix some salt into it and if you dissolve a lot of salt into it and just let it sit, that will eventually have salt precipitate out of the water and it might form little nice crystals on the bottom. And that's essentially what happens here. When you have a lot of Not dissolved minerals. But I see a shark. Oh. Oh, where? What? Uh, left. Hey there. Or at least some sort of fish. <laughs> yeah. Looks large. Yeah. Potentially shark like. Sorry, uh, I see it now. Continue. <laughs> oh, no, it's good. It's always nice when we can spot something that <laughs> we never thought would drift into view. But yeah. So that's just a little science experiment you can all do. And yeah, that's uh, pretty much the chemistry of how these rocks are formed. And whenever we find minerals precipitating, that forms what's called a sedimentary rock. So much of the crusts that are on these rocks are sedimentary, but beneath you're actually finding igneous rocks, most of it being from the earth, like basalts and uh, other materials like that, that I believe Pablo was talking about. So yeah, this gives a interesting history of how these rocks are formed. And when we take samples up from our ROVs, we often cut them in half to look inside and see the different features. And we learn about that history. Um, and they're really pretty and they're iridescent usually and you can see them moving in um, like a kind of undulation yeah yeah that's the word yeah one of my favorite organisms are they ever bioluminescent um some can be um, I don't I don't know how many are and how many aren't but I know some can be oh some sort of other jelly thing but yeah all depends on what they consume, I think. But yeah, we're at about 900 meters. Um, our estimated time to the bottom is like 10 minutes or so. So stay tuned. So for those of you who are interested in joining our team, uh, there are many opportunities of working aboard uh, the Nautilus and working for the Ocean Exploration Trust. Uh, there are opportunities ranging from working in the crew and chefs to being scientists aboard and science communicators such as myself, video engineers, engineers, and others, as well as opportunities for artists and people to uh, document. And we can check those opportunities out on our website if you go under the education tab, there should be a tab that also says opportunities. And if you also go on the about page, you can see employment opportunities as well. And we are looking to fill uh, different STEAM roles, meaning science, technology, exploration, arts, and mathematics. This includes educators as well, and artists who can come aboard or help participate by, say, designing patches, designing educational materials, providing public outreach through ambassador programs, or even uh, STEM career role modeling. And above all, we are just looking to extend our reach and our education of the deep ocean.
Unfortunately, we didn't get a look at any um, oceanic white dip sharks that might have been around when we launched, but there was rumors of them being around the ship. So maybe when we come back up. Ooh, fingers crossed, my favorite. Yeah. Fingers crossed for that. Anything else surprising you could see? All right, we're about 100 meters off the bottom now. Hmm? Yeah, I I prefer if you just have that your hand on that. Now you can maintain the same speed. Those two lines that you're seeing, those are our measurement lasers. So um, where those lasers kind of converge in the middle, it's about 10 centimeters so that we have a better idea of how big everything we're seeing is. So you can see all this, kind of start seeing some returns in your sonar. Mm -hmm. So we'll just go right down to as far as we can. If it's pretty, it's pretty flat, flattish there, I, I believe. So we'll okay. probably go right down to 20 meters, but we'll use this as a guide. Okay. So I have a question for video and the uh, Herc team, if you're available. Uh, just hold on, that, hold on that thought there, Daniel, please. We're just in the last 50 meters here. Yeah, sure. Kind of final approach to the bottom, so to speak. We'll get oriented and then uh, be happy to take that. Yep. No problem. Take your time. We can see the bottom approaching now. Mm -hmm. It's 
sure it's longer now. Yep. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, it looks like we can get Argus all the way down to 20. Nice. Actually, just hold here because I got the slope in front of her. Here, I don't have a lot of room. Uh, okay. And we're going to be proceeding this way, right? Yep. Okay, Sarah, I think you can actually just drive Argus a little bit over to port, like take up a 270 degree heading. Okay. Looks like we're seeing a lot more the tritus floating nearby. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm wondering if something got like eaten recently <laughs> or something. Because this looks like, I don't know. Like Is this a good spot to hang out for a second so we can switch to the DVL? Uh, yeah, generally. Just give us a couple of seconds here. We'll get almost properly oriented. And, uh, we'll do the video, white balance, and we'll do. Auto heading on. Roger, thank you. It's gonna Herc doesn't go laterally so well. Let's just go this way. Okay, and then we'll come down another few meters, Sarah. And Nav, you can go ahead with the DVL. Awesome. Uh, keep coming. I'm on about 15 meters delta when we're on the, when Herc's on the bottom here. Is this still the top of the sea mount here? Awesome. Uh, DVL is set up. DVL is good. Okay. And standby video.
Uh, yes, Daniel, we are on top of a seamount. Okay, double checking. And for those of you at home, maybe you're watching a feed and thinking, hey, maybe this feed is, uh, the water seems a little lighter than usual. And that's because we are diving on top of the seamount right now. We're doing a shallower dive today to help with our um, tests on the round spectrometer. And to go a little more gently on the RFPs this time around. Okay, zoom in there. Alrighty. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna go black first when you're ready. Go on. All right, go on black. 